What's going on, nerds? My name is Jesse, and we're back again with another Two Guys Review This Movie. I'm back in with my brother, Justin. What's up, guys? We saw Dunkirk last week. We've already tried to record this once, but we blew it, so we're back here for the re-recording. Out of 10, what do you give it? I definitely give it... <laughs> Excuse me. I give it right around 8 or 9. It's a fantastic film. I mean, I'm really happy with what they did with this. It's probably the most realistic war adaptation I've ever seen in a movie. Yeah, for me, I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10. Um, I really liked it a lot. I just think at some points, it's just maybe a little too intense for me. And um, a couple of times, there's repeated themes that I think could maybe be left out. But other than that, hyper-realistic, super visceral, and um, yeah, man, great film. Uh, what was your favorite part about the movie, Justin? My favorite part is probably, <clears throat> I have to say overall, the lack of dialogue in the film makes everything a little bit more tense so there's a point in the film uh we're in spoiler territory yep spoiler territory perfect <laughs> where tom hardy's character has already lost his other pilot. So it's just him moving on and it's just silence there's no words being spoken he's not talking to himself giving us uh, um disposition on what he's feeling he's just flying and shooting and yeah. it just kept everything really tense for me and i really like that yeah, Tom Hardy does not talk for the second half of the film, which is a, you know an interesting decision, especially since he's such a great actor. But uh, I actually really enjoy that. The lack of dialogue is definitely a big thing in this film. It's one of the big complaints from the people who do not like the film. They think that it hinders the story. But to me, the story is not about the soldiers. The story is about the event and what's happening in Dunkirk and the 400,000 soldiers that need to get rescued and the civilian boats that come to save them. That's the story to me. And the lack of dialogue makes it more intense. Uh, what would you think about the main character, Tommy, Fionn Whitehead? I think he plays the role really well. I mean, you really have this sense of fear but as you watch him that, you know, he wants off this beach by any means necessary. He wants to live. And every time that he gets into a problem, you feel that fear with him. It's very, he's a very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? He's a very emphatic character, someone you can really emphasize for. Sure. Yeah, I agree. I think he is really good in the role. I mean, he talks maybe three or four lines in the whole film, and um, they're really important lines. And I think that's, like, Nolan really pays that off. He doesn't say a word till they get onto the boat with the jelly toast. He says a couple of lines to Harry Styles' character, and then at the very end, he pays it off when they're on the train on the way home, and he's reading the paper. And it really gives you that, like, nice ending. Like, he doesn't speak at all, really, and so he'll fill it, and then he pays it off at the end. I really liked him a lot. Mm, I definitely agree. Now, uh, going back to that train scene, uh, something that was really interesting, and I don't think we've talked about this before, you and I, but um, there is a lot of... Uh, how do I put this? They There's a lot of animosity from other soldiers about what they were going through, and I felt like that was really important because of how few dialogue there was that some of the dialogue options that they chose really give you a good uh, outlook on what they were feeling at the time because of the fact that because of the fact that you know when they are coming back off the boat when they finally made it back you know they're complaining where were the pilots and then the blind man sending them the towels he says he couldn't even look us in the face when well, we very clearly can see that he's blind well, yeah, well, we we don't clearly see until he touches uh, yeah. Tommy's face. I mean, yeah, no. See, here's what Harry Styles is feeling there. Harry Styles feels like they lost, right? He feels ashamed. He feels like everybody's going to hate them because they lost the war and they're coming back with their tails between their legs, right? Well, in reality, and that's why he doesn't read the, he doesn't want to read the paper at the end because he doesn't want to yeah. read them, um, you know, talking down on them when in reality the guy that's tapping on the glass is actually giving him uh, you know a beer and going hey man we're happy to have you back and that he doesn't realize that until uh Fionn whitehead reads the paper yeah but that was the common perception for all of the soldiers they all felt that way and that feel like that really leads to why there were so such high emotions about you know getting back and why they were frustrated with the french and it all it all comes together throughout the film that you know everyone is mad because they feel like they've lost yeah, I agree. I think the um, 
animosity is more about survival more than anything else because like the french will no matter what hate the english now because the english get to leave and the french have to stay until the french boats show up right they have a line there where um kenneth branagh says or i don't think it's kenneth branagh it's one of the lieutenants says like when the french boats show up you can get on the french boats but these are english boats and the english people are going to get on the english boats uh, i don't think it's kenneth branagh no, but it's, no, it's, it's like a yeah, lieutenant, lieutenant yeah but kenneth branagh does stay which i think is really cool yeah, I think that was cool too. But like that, that builds up plenty of animosity alone. But I think it's uh, through a few points. You know, let's talk about the time for a second. Actually, when we get the uh, time jumps in the film, if you're not aware, there's three major time things that are happening in the film, and Nolan loves to play with time. We got the mole, which lasts one week. That's the beach or the dock. I think is actually called the mole. Yeah. We got the sea. That's one day. And we get the uh, air, which is one hour. And all these things clash in the middle of the film. Which I think they handle that beautifully, by the way, how they clash it. It doesn't <clears throat> it doesn't feel overwhelming. It is a little confusing at first, but I feel like that is important. They are not holding your hand for this film. They are telling a story in the best way that they can. I feel like they did it beautifully. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's pretty hard to follow on the first viewing. Um, I'd say a second viewing, or if you're really, really into the film at that first viewing, maybe you can pick up on it. Um, it's hard to see, but I think when they all crash together... See, things happen in the movie twice. A couple of things happen twice. Like, we see the plane crash twice. We see it once from the pilot's point of view and once from Tom Hardy's point of view. And those two things are, are completely different. Like, when, when Tom Hardy sees him and he sticks his hand out the window... Um, Tom Hardy thinks, okay, he made it, when in reality, the guy's sticking his hand out the window because he's stuck and he can't get the freaking glass over, right? So you see things twice. You see Killian Murphy twice. You see him once where they pick him up on the boat with the, um, uh, Mark Rylance, his character, picks him up when they're when he's just on the boat by himself. And also we see him on the sailboat where he, or like, I guess it's like a little tiny, like canoe type boat where, um, the two other characters are trying to get on the boat, but he says we capsized twice. So you see things a couple of times, and when you're seeing them, you're like, wait, does that happen twice? What's happening? And it's because they're going back in time or they're jumping forward in time in certain points of the movie. Yeah, and I think that this is done in such a way that you can really get insight into what everyone is feeling while things are happening without it feeling like we're just jumping back and forth. Uh, I feel like they handled the time changes very smooth where it's not going back and forth to the past and to the future. It's going forward once and then coming back and going forward again through another spot. Yeah. Well, there's a shot that we see from Mark Rylance's boat. He's the guy with his two sons or one son and a, and a, mm -hmm. like a helper guy. Um, when we see the shot of that two boats, we see it like three times, I think we see it when uh, he's pulling it. He's in the ocean. He saves the guy out of the ship that's drowning. And we see the two boats. We see the destroyer. And we see the boat that's half sinking. So we see that a couple of times. And then you start to put it together that that boat that's half sinking, that's the Harry Styles boat with him and the other two main characters. So when you see those things, you're like, wait, what's happening? What's that boat sinking? And then you see the guy swimming away from that boat. Those, that's those guys. That's the two stories, two timelines clashing. The guys that are on the boat with all the holes in it, they're coming to crash into Mark, Mark Rylance's boat. Mm-hmm. And I definitely think that this is something that can easily be overlooked, but it's handled in such a way that you really feel like there's not much that you're going to miss, even throughout the beginning half of the film. Like, there's not important concepts to the timeline that are that are mentioned or talked about in the early parts of the film that allow you to get a better sense of what's happening before the big jumps come to it. Yeah. Yeah, I do want to talk about the, the scene where um, Harry Styles and them are covered in oil and they get onto the Mark Rylance's boat and we find out that Georgie is dead. And I think uh, Harry Styles gets a great line there where when he comes down there, like, be careful, be careful with that guy. And Harry Styles looks up at him and goes, he's dead, mate. And that's like a really impactful moment of the film because you don't know if that guy's alive, dead, was he blind, he can't see what's happening. And then Killian Murphy, right after that, ask the kid is the boy going to be okay and he gives them the nod like yeah he's going to be okay and we get another great no dialogue scene with mark rylance giving his son like that nod of approval you know yeah i definitely agree and i think that that's a real turning point for the character itself in which earlier in the film uh killian asked him you know is the boy going to be okay 
And he says, no, like he's mad. He's frustrated yeah. with him for what happened. And that frustration, I feel like, is really important to show that the character is developing. And he's maturing and understanding that this is a war and things are going to happen. People are going to die. Yeah, I think that character actually has a really nice arc. Like his his father, Mark Rylance, um, doesn't really have much of an arc. He's strong, steely from the beginning. He knows that he's going into a war zone. But his son, a couple of times when uh, when Georgie first gets pushed downstairs and his head's hurt, we need to turn back. Are you going to turn back? And then he sees the ship uh, or the plane that's crashed in the water. And he goes, he's dead, Dad. We got to leave him. He's dead. And we actually save him. And he, re- I think that's his main turning point when he saves a guy that he's got to, this is war and we got to do something to save these guys. Cause if we don't, nobody's going to. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I feel like throughout this film, there's a lot of character development that you'll see films with lots of dialogue and lots of, uh, disposition from exposition. characters, exposition. I'm sorry, from characters. And yet, they don't get the same plot and character development that this film gets. And I feel like it's really done beautifully. This is such a great film for what they're trying to do. Yeah, I agree. I definitely think it's one of the better war films out there. And I do want to talk about the sound design a little bit, especially when those German planes are coming over the top and you get that fucking noise of them coming by and dropping the bombs. And from what I understand, we're not the only guys in that theater that thought that was really loud. Apparently everybody else had the same experience in their theaters that it was bumped up on purpose because Christopher Nolan does like to mess with the sound in the theaters and um, the sound of those German bombers coming over is so terrifying when you hear that coming across you know that and they all just get down on the ground like there's nobody running around there's no getting away from it the bombs are gonna drop where they drop and either you make it or you don't and that's terrifying yeah it really is and it gives you such a a better sense of what's going on it puts you into their shoes which i think that overall i think that's what they ended up trying to do they're trying to give you a sense of what it felt like to be in that moment yeah well it is a huge moment in history when churchill's asking for thirty thousand men they think maybe we'll be able to get forty thousand but there's four hundred thousand men on the beach and they get almost everybody off the beach which is crazy so i think the movie had to be told And I think some of the uh, most tense scenes are the drowning scenes. It happens three or four times in the film. Um, When we first get on the destroyer with the jelly bread and tea, that boat fills up with water and somebody in Harry Styles and Tommy almost die. And then on the, uh, the guy in the plane almost drowns. And then also Harry Styles, Tommy, and the French guy almost die on the boat with the holes in it. Wait, can we talk about that scene, those scenes for a moment? Because those are very it super tense sort of, for me yeah very tense like you generally think people are like they're gonna die in this there's no hope of getting out of here and the scene uh especially on the destroyer where he's underwater there for probably a good 15 to 30 seconds watching him and the camera is underwater the entire time watching him watching people scramble around him yeah that's he's a getting, terrifying like, feeling and shit people are like trying to get to the top but there's no top yeah, mm-hmm. I think um, there's a great setup and payoff there because um, Tommy hasn't said anything at all this whole film, except for when he says, I'm English, I'm English, don't shoot at me. Um, Harry Styles comes up to him and goes, hey, what's up with your uh, mate? He's kind of crazy. And he goes, he gives him a good excuse. He says, hey, he's just looking for a way, the fastest way out if this thing is to go down, right? And then mm-hmm. it does go down, and the French guy saves him, right? I think that's a nice little setup and immediate payoff. Mm-hmm. And I think it's insane that, you know, this guy that you don't know, and he's French. He knows that there's animosity between the two. At least I think he knows. He knows it's not yeah. told, but yeah. Well, he, he knows he the animosity. The, he kills the Englishman to take his uniform and get in line and save himself. That's the whole first You think scene he killed him? Film. Yeah, that's I thought why he's burying that guy. Well, I thought he was burying him because he found the dead body. I think when he, like, when they show up and uh, Tommy looks at him and they're looking at the lines and he puts his belt on, I think that's your cue to go that he just picked up that guy's clothes. And he's barefoot, too, the guy yeah. he's burying, you know? Yeah, I knew oh, wait, he and he's clothes. tying his shoes. He's tying his shoes yeah. as, the, as uh, Tommy pushes the sand up to the guy's barefoot, you know? Yeah, he got his clothes. I just, I'm not sure if he killed him or not. I feel like, like he could, he could have took a wounded guy or something like that, yeah. or a guy was already dead, maybe. I feel like it's meant to be interpreted however you feel it, because there is definitely the animosity and the tension too, where you just don't know. 
Yeah, all I'm saying is he knows that they're not taking French people, and that's why he took that Englishman's. Yeah. So to come back and save the Englishman, I think that that is a really telling moment for his character. Well, I think him and Tommy are just kind of bonded right from the beginning because all they want, all they care about is to survive. And I think that's a big theme in this in this film is, you know, having the, the want and drive to survive, to go out into the ocean. And he'll swim back to the goddamn boats. He'll try to get in there. Um, you'll sit in a boat full of holes in it trying to get off because you just want to survive, right? That's like mm-hmm. a huge theme in the film, right? Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, going past that point, I have to wonder, though, what would have happened if Collins had kept going with him on the po- from the air point of view? Because the whole point is that he doesn't know how much uh, fuel he has. He's taking guesses on it. And if Collins had come with him, he probably would have had more fuel because in the, I believe in the earlier points of the film when they're calling fuel, Collins had more. I think that the major point in how he was able to stop the plane was that, uh, stop the plane that was going to shoot the mole was that he couldn't be heard coming through because his uh, engine was off. Those are little things I just think about, though. Sure. I also think that that shot is just incredible of the plane flying by with no propeller and everybody staring at him with this sense of dread. And then you hear the German bomber. And then we don't even see him take it out. We see the German bomber just crash into the water and then he flies by again. That's such mm-hmm. like a f- dramatic, incredible scene. That That's a shot that you could frame and put on your wall. It's so incredible seeing the sol- soldiers cheer up for the Air Force who hasn't been there. He's got no film. They know that, that he has no fuel. They know that he's probably going to die for this or at the very least get captured by the Germans. Yeah. And talking back about Tom Hardy's character, which I don't think he has a name. I think he just has a call sign being Fortis, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, somebody... Fortis Leader. I see Farrier. Is it Farrier? I thought Farrier was the other one. No, he's the Squadron Collins, Leader. Jack Lodens, Collins, Tom Hardy, Farrier. Okay. So Farrier, then, in that case. I think that he plays the role, Tom Hardy, very well for someone that is willing to do whatever it takes to make sure that the job is completed. And that end scene where he's, pull, where he's uh, putting the flame on fire and just watching... As he as uh, German soldiers come in and take him away, it's just a fantastic scene. Yeah, it's a bad really telling scene, man. He looks like, you know, that just gives you an idea of what kind of person it takes to be like a badass soldier in some of these wars, man. You're willing to sacrifice your life to save hundreds of thousands of people, right? And he does it right there. He saves everybody on that beach, and he gets taken by the German army. He's a prisoner of war now, POW. And another thing there is I'm really happy to see that they didn't kill him off. In a day and age where a lot of films are leaving no good endings, they could have absolutely killed off Tom Hardy's character, and it wouldn't have affected the film very much. He would have still been loved, and he still would have been respected for doing what he had to do to finish the mission. But they didn't, and they gave a little bit of hope that he could be released one day. Yeah, no, I agree. I, and there's barely any resolution in this film because it's the uh, a middle thing that happens in the middle of the war. Like, the war's not over by the end of this film. We're going on to fight more in Britain and wherever else the World War II takes, on, takes place in. But mm-hmm. um, I don't think you need resolution in this film because the resolution is that they got him off the beach. Like, that's the story. The story arc is what is it? what do we do to get off this beach? How can we get everybody off the beach? It's not about... Um, the war ending or Tom Hardy surviving, the resolution is just to get the people off the beach. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, that's about all I had to talk about. Anything you want to talk about, brother? Um, yeah, I do want to talk about one scene that I thought was really, really cool. I thought the uh, Mark Ryland scene where he's like, wait for my call, and they got the German bomber coming to bomb their civilian ship. And he's like, wait for my call. We got to wait for him to commit. I thought that was a really intense, like, fun scene. And then we get the great reveal that um, his his other son and the kid's brother was a uh, Air Force plane fighter as well. Yeah, that is a really good film, a really good point because the I believe it's Killian that looks over him like, oh, you were in the military? No, it wasn't. He goes like, how much do you know about these planes? And he's because mm-hmm. he knows everything about the planes, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, I thought that was a really cool setup payoff scene because he's been talking about the plane since the very beginning. Oh, that's a, uh, you know, F-24 or whatever the fuck they're called. I don't know anything about planes. But uh, I thought that was cool. It was a good setup and payoff. I love the way Christopher Nolan does that. He always sets things up early. He reminds you of them throughout the film. And then somewhere in the late part of the film, it becomes relevant. I thought that was really cool. Yeah, I definitely agree. And it was also a telling moment where um, I personally had thought, and I tried to lean over and tell you during the movie, that I thought that the father was actually like an old war veteran. Me too. And he absolutely wasn't. It was his son. No, it was and his I thought son. That yeah. was a very cool moment that he had put that much into it because of how much he cared about his son. Right, yeah. And I think that's uh, like that's a, that's something that happens, you know, like, Serena Williams and Venus Williams dad he knows everything there is to know about tennis but he didn't play tennis you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. I think that's just like a father thing I just thought that was really cool I thought I love the way Nolan sets things up and pay and sets things up and then pays them off later um you got any uh, finishing thoughts brother uh I think it's a really great film I think if you are going to watch it it is really imperative that you try your best to pay attention to everything because it's very easy to lose something and then you've missed a big chunk of the film and nothing really makes sense anymore yeah i agree i think it's a two watch movie you need to watch it probably at least twice um that happens with a lot of nolan films you know films like interstellar and even the dark knight's a two watch movie if you ask me personally um but yeah i liked it a lot i think i i'll always look forward to whatever nolan produces because he is a great filmmaker um, like I said, if you like this stuff, we're trying to post these every Tuesday. If you uh, like these reviews, please let us know. Follow us on Twitter, and I will catch you guys on the flip side. Later. Later.